What, what, how would you say high performance and what, what makes high performance? Oh, that's a, uh, probably, ultimately, it just comes down to, well, there's a few things, but hard work. There's the only, I, I haven't met anyone yet who hasn't, who's got to the top without, in anything they've done, without a lot of hard work. Um, it's boring to say, it's like the, the thing, and, and it's gone in the, the added bits away from what people see. So, as I mentioned there, I was at, at, at about 14 or 15, I, I, I went running twice a week before school. I went swimming twice a week before school only just to get fitter. You know, that was the only purpose to do it, not um, for any other class or club. It's just me trying to get fitter. So it was kind of an example, from, uh, I suppose, from my from my career that the hard work is kind of like a given. Like You have to work hard on the bloke next to you. That's kind of my mentality. If I worked hard on the bloke next to me in the change room, I knew that um, I'd always be that one step ahead and that, was, that that is one of the main ingredients of a high elite sport. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. And then obviously you, you were uh, really privileged to go and represent the, uh, England and take that honour of being the captain. Um, in, in the England team and in, in the, the teams you played in, what, what, is, do you, what would you define as culture uh, and what behaviours to you are really, really important? Yeah, I mean the the culture is always it's a really interesting one because you know you spend you spend quite a lot of time on the psychology of that. You, you're talking about what what is the team, how do you want the team to operate in certain things. You know, you had where the thing called a player charter, where the players made the rules, um, uh, and sometimes it felt authentic. You know, certain teams it felt authentic, certain teams it felt forced. You know, depending on what it what it was. We spent quite a lot of time doing it, I suppose. Um, you know, talking about it actually, and I, I, the good examples I got it. The one at Essex now, um, it's it's a great culture in terms of a lot of the guys are young Essex. They're kind of two groups. You've got young Essex like players and some slightly older ones who have been around the club for a while. And we never once mentioned culture, but you are expect you know not expected, but you want to turn up for the team socials. You want to kind of put in for the club if they ask you to do say a sponsor thing. It's kind of like. You, that is what's happened in the past. You kind of carrying on that tradition. Um, I suppose in the, on the England side, there's a lot. I mean, because it's you bring in lots of different people in from different, you know, age groups, um, different uh, backgrounds, different times. And you know, someone might play for two games, someone might for a hundred games. So you, and it's a kind of this revolving door where obviously the Essex is obviously a bit more set side. And it like the bit which I I was enforcing when I was there was when you become an England player you you're an England player twenty four seven you're an England player not just when you've got the 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 um tracksuit on not just when you're training with the England side or you have got the hat on is when it's everyday life you are representing England for the rest of your life as an England player and I think you had a duty to to kind of act in a certain way and certain decisions you make are vital you know kind of that was kind of like would a would people want me to sit? Would want people to see that? And that's kind of what I kind of try to push in the uh, twenty four seven England player. And I think it, it went down quite well because it's quite an easy thing to kind of just talk about and be, and act really. Yeah, oh, that's good. And then in terms of your role as captain, how how did you go about impacting other people around you? Yeah, I mean, you're asking some really questions which I could go on for like days about, but yeah, you know, ultimately I. As as a captain of the cricket team, I was, you know, you've got to be able to be a tactician, you've got to be a, a shoulder to cry on, you've got to be a, a support bubble for certain players. You sometimes you've got to be, you know, the hard taskmaster because you're not like a football captain, a rugby captain. There's a lot of responsibility with kind of decisions you are making as an England captain on the field, off the field. You get quite a lot of responsibility, so it's um it's quite hard to to say what you did you just it was a great job because not only were you captaining your country which is a huge honor but you you know you didn't quite know what was going to throw at you every single day it was a it was a brilliant job it's hard work um but yeah impacting play was the better you know someone this is going to really cliche it's not the better you know someone the more advice you can give them because you know how you know what makes them tick and how how they operate so someone like obviously James Anderson or Stuart Broad who I who I played a, a lot of cricket with um it's quite easy to try and you can see what mood they're in or you see what how they respond to certain things people certain players respond um you get the best out of them by putting an arm around the shoulder certain resp- players would want you know a bit more forthright feedback so it, it, you've got to you've got to be right and you also got to pick your moments as well yeah, yeah that's good um 
just in terms of, of you personally, who, who's influenced you uh, the most and why? Uh, it's a really good, another uh, good question. I think I, I suppose the person who's influenced me most would have to be Graham Gooch. Um, probably the guy sitting there probably don't really know who he is, but the slightly older generation. He was kind of like the opening player, opening batsman before the, the generation before, and he obviously, obviously an Essex player, um, Essex um, captain and legend as well. And yeah, so he was the one who kind of took me under his wing at 18 when I first joined the staff at Essex. He was there. He was my hero as a youngster, and it's quite obviously quite strange when you meet your hero. Um, and then he became my mentor. He was the kind of the guy who's who'd be throwing balls at me at seven in the morning for a couple of hours, or and he'll be the person I'll talk a lot of cricket to. And to have someone who played for Essex, played in your position, opened the batting, played for England, and had kind of done their kind of done their career, and you're kind of following exactly the same footsteps. You couldn't have had a better like teacher, really. You couldn't have bloke to to kind of pick the brains off, and you know for Probably over eight or nine years, we had a, a brilliant working relationship on that side. And, um, you know, how lucky was I to have someone as good as that in my corner? Yeah, well, amazing. Um, yeah, two, two questions for me and it's over to the kids. Um, out of all your accomplishments, I'll put the teeth in, um, what are you most proud of and why? And I guess that could be many. Um, I think being part of just a successful team. Um, you know, there's some great players who haven't, been part of a successful England team and, and we we played in a generation which won a lot of games of cricket. Um, we had some tough times along the way um, but you know we had some memories which you just can't no one will ever take away from us. Winning winning in Australia first time in 20 odd years, becoming number one side in the world, winning in India, winning in South Africa, all these places which isn't doesn't happen very often. We were part. I was part of that and, and it's probably a bit more luck than judgment um, in, that, in some of the stuff about who the, you can't pick your teammates so for me to to have played I, I think alongside some of England's greatest ever players um, you're looking at James Anderson I mentioned him for you know 600 wickets Stuart Broad 500 wickets now these these guys are going down in you know absolute fault lords. so to play with them for over 100 times you know that is that is good that's probably what is my biggest thing I I, I can I've sat in the change and winning more games of cricket although I think James Anderson's just gone past me but you know, than any other person. That is, you know, that's a good thing to say. Oh, good. Um, and then final one for me is, what are your three non-negotiable behaviours? Um, one would have to be hard work. There's, there, there's a none. There's absolutely no. Um, if you want to get to be elite, that has to be or be a part of an, a, a thing that is a non-negotiable. Um, the second one, I mean, it's. <laughs> It's that the problem is you come out with cliches and you kind of uh, I think one of them one of them would probably be yourself um, because if you if you're not yourself and you're acting to be someone else it, it doesn't work it doesn't work for in the team it doesn't work um, it might work for a week or so but eventually the cracks will come so to be yourself um, and the third one. Uh, I don't know because you 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 can get quite complicated. You start going down the honesty route, it, it becomes a little bit tricky. And I, I I say that for one reason because you know as a captain here, so someone says you have got to be honest in teams and stuff. Well, that's fine, of course you do. You want people to be open and honest. But say as a captain, you you go to a bowler the day before a game. I'm sorry, you you we're we're not playing you in the next game, and they ask you why, when you say. Well, actually, you're not bowling as, as well as I'd like you to do. You're not quite doing that, obviously, like you, what you should be doing. I mean, you tell them that straight, you know, that is, um, that's all honest. It's all good. But then say that there's an injury the next day and he's then back in the side and then you told him honestly your feedback. Then, you know, you, you know, you can, uh, you can like, you know, he's then thinking, well, you don't rate me. So it's a bit of a, there's a strange one. Obviously, there are absolute times of certain feedback. So I'm gonna, I, I can't actually say a non-negotiable third one without... I'm uh, really thinking about it and uh, giving it a bit of time. Okay, no, that's good. That's awesome. Thanks so much for that. Um, right then, we've got the exciting. Hello, my name is Holly. Um, my question is, what is the quickest? Who is the quickest bowler you have ever faced? Oh, good question, Harry. Um, the quickest bowler I faced was a guy called Sean Tate. Then I remember Sean Tate. He probably played a little bit before. Your time. He actually played at Essex, and he's got a nickname, which, if I could just remember what it was, it gives you a 
thing, but I can't actually remember. But he bowled a ball at me at 157 k's an hour, which is just under 100 miles an hour. It's about 98 miles an hour. Um, and that, that was that was uh, as quick as a quickest ball as I've ever faced. Um, and the, the quickest spells of bowling would be Mitchell Johnson, 2013-14, when he bowled he bowled brilliantly for the whole series, and we lost five nil. Um, but yeah, that, that that when it gets when it gets above 90, 92, 93, you know, you know it's coming, it's whistling down you. And if you ever if you ever want to have a bit of fun, put the bowling machine on ninety mile an hour. And just don't try and hit it, but try and stand next to it and just see how quick it comes. And that'll give you a slight indication of what we have to deal with when they bowl that fast. Cool. And you broke up there, I said, so who, who was that, sorry? Who was your fastest bowler? Oh, sorry, a guy called uh, Sean Tate. Oh, OK. Sean Tate, he bowled, I've got, I'm trying to just Google his nickname here quickly. Um, he bowled one oh. at 157k an hour. Wow. Which is just under, well, it's about 98 miles an hour, which is quick enough for anyone. So yeah. I'm just googling to see his. He's got quite a good nickname, but struggling to to get on. There we go. Um, yeah. So Sean Tate, have you got me now? Have I cut up or not? Cool. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll Google that ourselves. But brilliant. The Thank wild you. thing. The wild thing. That was his nickname. The wild thing. The wild thing. Fantastic. Right. Next one. You you aren't seeing double vision. We've got two twins in the room at the moment. Yeah. So introduce yourself and then ask your question. Hello. My name is. Jack. Actually, my question is, have your bats broken from hitting the ball so hard? <laughs> have my bat ever broken? Or well, how many bats? Oh, good question. I mean, everyone who knows who me, watched me play knows I don't whack it that much, but I reckon I've probably broken 30, 35 bats, 40, oh. I'd say. I mean, the most, if you, I tell you what most happens now, because you know how big the bats are? The bats are really big, and obviously with this has got through Grand Nichols, and they make brilliant bats, so there's nothing to do with their bats, but to get the wood as big as it is, they have to dry it out quite a lot. So dry it out, it makes them, uh, there's less moisture in it, so they're, lit, they're big but light, and they break quite a lot. And what tends to happen is you use them for a little bit, and then they, they break. If you hit one right at the end of the toe, because there's so much force going through it, it breaks. But they normally break straight away. So, like, if you get... You know, I've had a couple of net sessions where I brought a brand new bat out and thinking, oh, this is fantastic. Look how good it is. I can't wait to use it. You play two or three shots and then just for whatever reason, it just it just goes. It's like cracks in the toe. And unfortunately, you have to you have to kind of put it away. But, um, yeah, we are lucky. We kind of get sent a few. I'd probably every year I'd probably go through about 10 bats, maybe. So I'd have five at the start of the summer and then five for the winter. That would be kind of my thing So 10 bats a year. So I've been with Gray Nichols since I was. Well, I'll say since I was professionally 18. Well, I started when I was 13 with Grey Nichols. Um, so I'm 35. I'm just 22 years. I probably had 10 bats for 10 of those years. That's 100 bats, probably about 140 bats of Grey Nichols, 150 bats, I reckon I've had. Wow. How many do you have? Two. Two. <laughs> Who do you use? Who do you use? What's your bat? Uh, Grey Nichols Oblivion Cell. Ah, oh, good man. Good man. You've chosen the right one. Well done, Archie. <laughs> okay, Henry, do you want to come up? Hi, I'm Henry. Uh, my question is, which game have you learned the most from and why? Which game? Yeah, who you played. Oh, jeez. Oh, okay. um, what game have I... Do you know, the biggest... There's, there's probably... Okay, the biggest thing I ever learned in the whole... And the whole of this thing. So when I, I played against Australia twice when I was quite young, one in 2006, uh, we lost 5 0. And then one in 2009, and we, we won in 2009. Uh, I did okay. I got a 90 of the laws, but I think I averaged probably 30. So I didn't do great. Both times I averaged I think 20 odd in the 27, but I got 100 at Perth when I was 21. And then um, 30 against us there in that series. And so twice I played against Australia when I was young. And I th- Every other series, team I did pretty well against, except Australia. And then, so I then tried to change, totally change my technique. So I, I, I spent hours with Gucci trying to change my technique, thinking, you know, against a real elite level, that my technique, which I pre, like previously had, um, wasn't good enough. And I did it for about six months. And I scored a couple of test hundreds with it, scored some one-day runs. And then I played in 2010, I played against Pakistan. The ball nipped all over. And I just couldn't go out and run. I was all rigid. And because it's a bit... 
unusual but unnatural my technique uh, my kind of a new technique I um yeah I uh, I, bi- I binned it middle of a test match I went back to the old test old technique at the oval and I got a hundred and I, that what that proved to me is that you've got to keep trying to learn you've got to keep trying to improve but sometimes what what you actually been given god given or your natural way you've got to stick quiet thick and thin um but without doing that little journey of of eight months of exploring i wouldn't have known that so that was the biggest lesson for so, so since then i never really changed my techniques since 2010 i i kind of stuck with the same one and but just kept trying to groove it rather than make a huge change it's just trying to groove it and try and make those skills a bit better thank you cool. all right good stuff right come on half it's like when you come back to you, come on stop interview stuff big moment she's very excited about this Oh, yeah. Come, come here so you can see. Um, my question is, if you could go back in time to when you first started cricket, what advice would you give to yourself? Oh, that is a, it's a really good question. I'd probably learn to, pl- I'd probably learn the T20 game a bit more, judging mm-hmm. about what's happened in the game since, since I've started, um, with the old financial benefits of playing T20 in the franchises. Um, <laughs> but do you know what I would? I, I would, uh, if I was trying to teach, like, if I was someone who's young, who's loving the game now, I, it would be quite a boring message. It would be, why, like, it would definitely say, keep enjoying everything you do. Push the boundaries of, see what you can achieve. Like, have try and take that bit of fear of failure away from it. Like, in the net session, I used to hate getting out. I used to hate getting out sometimes in a net session. Sometimes they're perfect net sessions where you've got to be really switched on. But explore your game. Like try and push the boundaries because you just never know what what you could um, what you could achieve. Maybe I was a little bit um, kind of subdued in pushing those boundaries as a player. But um, that's maybe what I'd say. But ultimately, enjoy it. It's a great game, um, and don't take it too seriously. I think because unfortunately, game of cricket, you fail, don't you? How many times you get out for low scores? You know, I. I played 160 odd test matches. I only got 30 odd hundreds. So for the other, so for the other 100 and however 120 odd test matches, I was rubbish. So you got to think, you know, it's, you got to just be able to accept that and deal with it. Cool. Right, next up. It's like walking the gaunt, isn't it? <laughs> Hi, my name is Adam, and I would ask, um, when you're out of Nick, what would you do? Okay, I get asked. This, I get asked this quite a lot, um, and the, and there is no golden ticket to the answer, right? So a lot of people think, oh, I'm out of Nick. I've got to change this. I've got to change that. You kind of do a massive circle, and you keep searching for the next ticket. The the trick of trying to get back into form quick as quicker than you can, because you remember form is a very strange thing. It comes and goes, and it's only natural. Even the greatest players in the whole what history have ever played never ever just constantly score runs um so for me it was all about going back to my what i did simply the best so do you know what i mean when i say simply so i'd have three things on my head on my checklist would firstly would be my head position as a left hander was i falling over the ball do you understand what that means if like my head goes a little bit like that you know you hit it and your head's going there that's one am i am i moving my weight it was next thing am i moving my weight forward and back so am i getting my weight into the ball when it's full am i getting my weight back when it's back when it's short and thirdly can i hit the ball straight they're my three things in the checklist right because if you can do that then everything else will like will take care of itself your cut shot your pull shot they'll all happen with a bit of time so it will be right i'm going to groove that quickly i'm going to groove that for 20 minutes 30 minutes if i can do that then i know my game is in pretty order pretty good order and then when you get out in the middle it's about trying just to survive this is my method this might be someone else someone else might have a different method my method would say right i'm just going to try and bat for half an hour here i'm not going to worry about my runs i'm not going to worry about where i score my runs i'm not going to worry about my feet my head i'm just going to try and survive for half an hour and try and get that rhythm back because that's what it is when you're out of form you're just losing that rhythm um you know um so trying to just keep it as simple as that and just trying to face the one ball at a time and trying to get all those negative thoughts about or, you know, the bloke on your shoulder saying, cool, you haven't scored runs for a while. Go, cool, this ball is too quick for me. All that kind of stuff which happens. Try and get the, try and ignore those, though, there. They're always going to be there trying to ignore them and just focus on the ball. 
And that's kind of a way of trying to get back to form quickly. It doesn't always happen because that's what cricket's about. Um, the comes and goes in form. But if you can, so that was my checklist. So I knew my checklists were good. I could go to bed that night going, well, actually, my game's OK. It's just a bit of time in the middle. Cool. Well, all good. Well, OK, next question. Oh, we go. We've got a one-way system. I was going to say, like, look, look like they only have three children in the class. They just keep going and pulling them out. Hello. Hiya. My name is Finn, and my question is, do you think you would have benefited more from playing T20 and Rockwell Internationals for England, as you only played four, and do you wish that you would have also played IPL and youth franchises like that? Uh, do you know what? I have very, very little regrets about my career. Uh, I uh, do. I do. I wish I explored it. Maybe. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question because do you know what? I had one hell of a go. Um, and going to see the IPL looks fantastic. You know, obviously, I haven't been there. I've only ever watched it on TV. Um, and maybe I could have explored my game a lot. But do you know what? For me, the pinnacle of my cricket was always Test cricket. Maybe because it suited my game more. Uh, maybe, um, maybe because you know, more naturally I was a, a slower place player, um, so I found it easier. But the satisfaction I got from winning a one-day game or a Test match was just no comparison. It, you know, the satisfaction you sat after five days of hard work and you know the test of a T20 of a of a test match is unbelievable. You test mentally, you test physically, you test um, skill-wise. You know, every situation is different. And for me, that was the complete test of cricket. And I, I love watching T20. I do love it. Um, but it, it doesn't, to me, it just tests the cricket in two ways. You know, how you know how you can, you know, how far can you hit the ball and how many times you hit it out of the park. And as a bowler, you know, a bit of luck you need. Are your skills good enough there? And a bit, you need a lot of luck. Test Test cricket, there's no luck really involved. It's, it's you know, it get, you get found out in five days. Uh, the best sides normally win. So I prefer that kind of cricket. So I'm going to stick. I'm a bit of a traditionalist on that. Yeah. Are you in South Africa at the moment? No, I'm, I'm actually in Bedfordshire. <laughs> I'm right home in Bedfordshire. Do you know what I was doing today? You'll never believe it. Well, we have turkeys down the farm. So we're, we have to... You're on the farm, don't you? Yeah, we had to move turkeys from one yard to another. And if you ever try to move turkeys from one yard to another, you'll know they don't move very quickly. So that's yeah. what I was doing a bit today. You said that it was actually harder uh, being on a farm than actually scoring test runs. Yeah, I know. It is. It's hard work on the farm. Electric fencing, moving sheep, yeah. lambing sheep. Cricket's easy. You get to stay in nice hotels. You're not out in the cold. This morning, how cold is it? It's very cold. Exactly. I was out and about checking the sheep. Oh. Yeah. Good. And P.S. Uh, I like grey nickels, but I have to speak to that. Pardon? I have to speak to that, not the grey nickels one, but I do like the grey nickels. Sorry, then what bat do you use? Uh, uh, Ben Stokes is the GM. Oh, Stokes is the Gunner Moore. Yeah. Oh, we'll let you off just this once. Next one, you have to have a grey nickel. We'll, we'll, we'll convert into grey nickels, don't we? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, we've got our, our last question. This is from our head of cricket development, uh, Mr. Longshaw. Hi, okay. Hello, sir. Um, final one for me, I guess something for the kids to take away would be if you've got a sort of a go-to drill that you could do either at home or at the club or anything like that. Um, obviously, potentially outside if you're at home, you don't want to break any windows or anything like that. What would your sort of one go-to drill be, you think? Um, do you know the a real eat the go-to one would be a, a drop feed. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Someone standing right in front of you and drop and dropping the ball, one bounce, and then you, I mean you can play any shot really, any front foot shot to it, can't you? Yeah. So Gucci, so there's a great picture of me like Gucci standing next to me, just dropping the ball. A full England gets out of him. I was an England player, but, and you know it's such a simple thing, isn't it? Like, can you hit a, the ball exactly where you want to go and straight? You know, you can sweep it, you can go extra cover drive, and it just like as a as a cricketer, we spent we like a golf would absolutely. You know, have a, he has a technically has a swing coach, he has a putting coach. Technically, he's absolutely precise on it. And cricket's not quite got that same thing to it. But if your technique is so solid for your game, it can only help. So the apps, I I am convinced that drilling basics and grooving basics is so important. You know, I know all every kid wants to go and play the reverse sweep and you know hit over the top. Of course you go. You've got to be able to walk before you can run. And you can only play those shots if you've got good bases. You've got 
your head's in the right position. So I would be literally stripping every kid's technique down to can you hit the ball straight back where it comes from for the first 10 minutes almost every session because if you can groove that, then you can go on to play the reverse sweeps because you know you've got some really good solid basics to, to kind of move on from and work from. Okay, thank you very much. Awesome. Um, uh, what's on your wish list for Christmas? Oh, well, actually, I've got I've got a few of my things. Um, it's my birthday as well. I'm a Christmas Day birthday, so oh, fantastic. So I get I, I it has to be birthday in the morning and Christmas in the afternoon. Um, you get double presents. Well, I used to I used to get quite a lot of joint presents, Happy Birthday and Christmas, which I thought I was a bit hard done by. <laughs> uh, a wish list. I don't really. I, do you know what? I've got a ripped coat, so. Uh, I, I want I want a, like a nice smart coat which hasn't got a rip in it because I ripped it I caught it on something the other day so um, when you were batting where would fast bowlers normally bowl at you most times they would bowl for me just outside off stump trying to bring me forward uh, in the corridor of uncertainty I was I was a strong cutter I was a strong puller and was quite strong off my legs my my biggest weakness was on that fourth stump um, just trying to get my weight back into the ball so you know earlier I was saying. I'd be drilling myself to get my weight back into the ball. You know, I struggled to do that. My front leg was a um, could often be a little bit too straight, so my weight would be slightly too further back. Um, so that would where a fast bowler would try and bowl on, try and bring me forward, try and make me play a cover drive. Um, but obviously, there's, you know, there's margins of errors, and if you get too full, I'm I will put you away. And you'll see if they get drag it down a little bit, um, I'll cut you. So they, they didn't have too much margin for error, but that was where people bowled there. I would. I'd find it hard to score. Cool. Brilliant. Well, you won't take any more of your time. I know you... No, no, I, I've got... Do you know what? I've got... A, I do have 10 more minutes, so it's fine. Sure? I got, I, I quite easy. We started a bit early, so I'm all right. Brilliant. I, I think the kids have got more... Keep questions. going. See you everyone telling birthdays. Come on, then. Out you come. Okay. So, could you just turn the light? I'm just going to get some light here. Thanks. What was your proudest spinning you ever played in? Good question. Um, probably, probably my 235 in Australia at Brisbane in 2010. Um, so we, if anyone remembers that game, we were the first game obviously at Brisbane where Australia haven't lost for a long, long time. They always go to Australia because they always think they're going to win or go to Brisbane because they always think they're going to win. Um, we got 270. Peter Siddle actually got a hat trick and then they got 480 odd. So that we were. Yeah, we were 217, I think, behind and staring down the barrel of, you know, of a kind of defeat at the end of day three. And, um, yeah, I managed to get 100, a double 100. Uh, Jonathan Trott got 100. We put on 380, I think, for the for the second wicket. Um, and Strauss got 100 as well. So top three got 100. Uh, we were 517 for one. Um, and we saved that game. So that's probably, that probably my proudest innings, yeah. Cool. Is that unfair? Yeah. Amazing. Right, Bates, come out, you come. Um, if you didn't play cricket, what what would you do? Well, now, now I'd be a farmer. So I've married into a, my wife's a farmer and her family a farm. So we so I would be a farmer. Um, and actually I've just applied to do my lorry license. Oh it's, cool. It's winter, so yeah, I'll, so I can so Alice can drive the sheep around in a lorry, but it's about time I learnt to do it. So hopefully, fingers crossed, I can get it done in, in February. Then I'll be a proper lorry driver, proper farmer. Fantastic. That's a good one. Yeah, how are you come? Are there any spinners whose variations you can't pick? Oh, yes. Yes, there are. Um... Well, actually, I'll tell you what, I, I, I struggled to pick the ball out of the hand, okay? So, you know how some people said, oh, like, you, you pick a leg spinner like this, or when it lands, and when a googly, you can see more of the hand, and yes, you can do, um, but I, I, I mean, I, I struggled to do that as well as certain people. I, I just tended to watch the ball, so... So when the ball come down, like even Malarithra, one of the greatest ever spinners, like, yeah, yeah. You, could, you could watch the ball come down, so you could see which way it spun. Um, it became a little bit harder when the ball got a bit older and they bowled cross seam, you know, the hold it scrambled seams. So that became a bit harder. But you can you can see the ball like that. So yeah. as a bat as a batsman, like my thing, would be watch the hand. If you see something unusual, think, well, it could be something different, then as the ball comes down, you'll be able to you'll be able to like pick the ball. So 
use everything you can when you're playing. So don't just don't just think I oh, could look at the hand. You have to think of everything. And then if you you know certain bowlers, for example, say um, a leg spinner bowls a googly, he might he might drop his shoulder. He might to get to build a goal the googly, he might drop his shoulder a bit early, and you just suddenly see it. A bit like a bowler bowling a bouncer at you. Like he might run in a bit faster. You know he might he might do something differently as and that you pick up clues. So as a batsman, really like really focus on as soon as he like starts his run up, about halfway through his run up, start focusing on what he does because they give you so many clues of what they're doing. And um, and if you can pick up any of those clues, it can only help. One of us must have been hard because he had such an odd action and he's still got the most wickets ever. Yeah, he? he did. Um, uh, thank God he didn't have DRS when he played because he would have got a lot more wickets. But he, um, yeah, he was very hard. I played it. I played him okay actually uh, when I played against him. I got a couple of hundreds, so I, I managed to play him okay. But he was very, very hard work because he, sp- you know, he could spin the ball this much. It became yeah. very and hard. Did you ever face Shane Warne? Yeah, good. I did face Shane Warne. I didn't face him very much because uh, Glenn McGrath and Stuart Clark got me out before that in the 2006 series. Um, That's the first time. But I, yeah, I did actually. I got a hundred against him. So yeah. Yeah. So I just learned, I'm, I'm a leg spinner as well, and I've just learned to bowl the googly, and I'm trying to make it like less uh, obvious in your action. Yeah, but I don't think you need, at this age, if I was you, I'd just, I'd be all, I mean, yeah. I know very little about spin bowling, try and just keep trying to spin it as hard as you can. Yeah, and just get the runs as well. Yeah. It must also be cool because uh, you're called Chef as well, aren't you? You're nickname. I'm called Chef. And it's my Any favorite. idea why? <laughs> Pardon? Why? Any idea why? Um, no. What's my surname? Alice. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. All right. I've got a quick one for you, Alistair, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, th- did you play any other sports at school, and were you any good? Um, so I played. I, I played rugby. I played. Um, I played squash. Um, I, I I stopped rugby at sixteen. I. I didn't. Um, I didn't really go through puberty until I was sixteen, so it didn't want actually much fun when you you could still sing the choir high notes and uh, the bloke with full beards trying to like run at you. So I didn't. But I love it now. I played rugby now more, but I played a lot of squash. So squash was a game. I became half decent at squash, but now darts. I like my darts, like go karting. Um, I'll try anything. Play a bit of tennis, but so I did who's, play a lot. I basically when I was younger, I played everything. Who's your football team, Alistair? Uh, Luton Town. Oh, fantastic. Kenilworth Road. Kenilworth Road. 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 Mid, mid-table championship. We'll take it at the moment. We'll take it at the moment. When yeah. I started, I remember going to watch them in the, uh, in the com- when they're out of the, com- in the conference. So we, we had back-to-back promotions a couple of years ago. So doing okay. Yeah, no, really good. Uh, Henry, go for it. How do you feel when you're on nice little runs and you're, you think you're going to get 100? And how do you control yourself and just trying to wipe the wall? Well, it's a good question because actually, I although I scored the most hundreds, I've also got the most nineties. So, um, so I've actually been dismissed a hell of a lot of times in the nineties, um, and it's incredibly frustrating. Even though it shouldn't really matter because you'll take ninety every time you batted. But um, the, the trick is to try, if you can, is just to ignore the milestone. And now that's easier said than done because it's there. It's an, and it's what you get defined as in the batsman. You want to score hundreds, um, but. Yeah, you've just got to try and try and just ignore the bloke on the shoulder, um, and try and and just try and trust yourself that you will you will get those extra runs. And if it takes you a bit longer, um, then it does. Sometimes you fly through it. Look, I, I had an example, which the one which massive one which annoys me quite a lot was like, I never got a hundred against Australia in England. I got about three, I think I got an, an eighteen seven, eighty nine, and ninety five, and ninety six, and that ninety six. I got out. Mitchell Marsh bowled me just before the new ball, and I'd been grinding away. And I was thinking, oh, let's get my hundred before the new ball. I went for a big drive. I got inside out, dragged, dragged it on at Lords, um, and I was um, and I was thinking about the new ball. So I was, like changed my game for it. And then when the second innings came on, Mitchell Stark bowled me the first ball of the innings. He bowled me leg stump half volley, and I clipped it for four. And it just shows, doesn't it? The new ball, although you know, it would have made any difference. I I could have got a Jaffa, but I could have also got a. A, a ball to get me going as well so it just shows that even though you know how experienced i was there i played 130 140 test matches i was still ex- inexperienced well i still messed up looking for the 100 if, if you can try and ignore the bloke of the shoulder and just 
play everything. You know, you could go to 90 in three shots or it could take you half an hour. Thank you. Cool. Right, last one then. Go on, Bates. You can have one more. I've never been told that you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to like play cricket professionally. Well, I was told. Um, no, I was never told that I wasn't. Um, but at 16, 17, I, I suppose even at 18, I had my doubts. You know, I... I, I scored a lot of runs at school, but every time I went back to say play a six under 17, dress six under 19 or second team, and I was like, I never scored any runs. I literally didn't. I think my highest score was 27 for a couple of years. And now I played probably four or five games a year um, in the summer holidays. So, yeah, when you're doing that, you think, God, I, and, uh, I wouldn't be good enough. But I, I managed to just get kind of get through that stage. Um, what drove me was that fear of failure that, um, you know, I never thought I was good enough. So I was always pushing hard I was always trying to get better um, and I always thought that I wasn't going to be good enough for the next level but I somehow managed to, to do okay well awesome right thank you very much for that um, well you've got another one next so we'll uh, give you time for a little bit of a breather but yeah th thanks so much um